little over time. Anyway, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, and it, it is with our theme of community and community building. I'm very, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Leo Penta, who is, uh, has many different functions. He is a Catholic priest, originally from Brooklyn. He's a professor at the Catholic University of Applied Sciences in Berlin. He's also the founder of the German Institute uh, of Community Organization, which is, as I've learned, also uh, a, a movement, a global movement, community organizing, uh, that is happening in many places, which is a, uh, a movement that really brings in an active way community as a part of civil society uh, into the blooming phase. And we're looking forward to his talk, Town, Gown and Beyond. Uh, what does community organizing really mean? Leo. Esteemed members of the executive board, members of the faculty and staff, public officials, students, friends of the university, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Masters University for inviting me to give this lecture at your opening convocation. I'd like to extend a special thanks to President Martin Paul for encouraging me, encouraging me to take on this challenge today. When I put together the title for this talk, I didn't realize I would actually be wearing a gown. And a town and gown is uh, sort of the colloquialism that's used, at least in the United States, to talk about relationships between universities and the municipalities, cities, towns in which they are located. And this connects to community, and I want to connect it immediately because I want to start building some community right here. And I want to ask you to do something that may be a little bit strange for you in this context. I know those sitting in the first rows probably do know each other, but I'd like to ask you to look to the person next to you, behind you, in front of you, and maybe uh, just greet them, tell them your name, and uh, say hello. Okay, if I might call us back to order. This, this is dangerous because it can sometimes happen then that uh, people get involved in conversations with one another, but that's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. But as we all know, I think the relationship between universities and the cities in which they reside, or what I've called here town and gown, is as old and varied as universities themselves. Their relationship is invariably complex and quite often controversial because at least four major constituencies interact. The mostly long-term but also sometimes recently arrived residents of the locale in question, the governance of the town, both elected and administrative, the university with its own leadership and long-term infrastructure, and finally the students who are much shorter-term constituents of both the town and the university. There is always power and there is usually money involved in all of these interactions. There are any number of short and long-term interests that are continuously intersecting, some compatible with one another, many colliding, many more in fact perhaps not clear even to the actors themselves. My own experience with the relationship between town and gown was not very positive. When I was a student, I was at a campus at a university that was sort of uh, a fortress in the midst of a neighborhood that was considered to be a no-go area. And there was almost no real contact between the university and the surrounding neighborhood. In fact, it was considered to be dangerous ground. And a number of my fellow students were in fact mugged uh, on one of their excursions into the surrounding territory, so to speak. And when I was a professor later at another university, uh, they didn't even bother to go into the city. They were located comfortably in the suburbs, but usually told their students not to take the short train ride into the city because that was a bad place. <laughs> 
all the more reason, I think, to take up this question because it is certainly obvious that urban universities, on the one hand, can no longer consider themselves either <laughs> safe havens or even oases or ivory towers exempt from the pressing issues of their locality. And by the same token, a locality can't simply act as if a university were not in its midst, especially when the university may be one of the main things that keeps a city or a town viable. Students, more than ever, are not just wards of the university and denizens of the library and classroom, if you will, but local citizens with a variety of allegiances. Yet they should and do move on after a relatively short time. Local citizens, both those well-established and some of the newer residents on the scene, usually see the university either as a boon or some as a bane to their life in the town. So just how do we get some sense of community out of this seemingly seething mass of constituencies and interests? And I'd like to offer some thoughts on this question from my perspective as a community organizer. But first, what exactly is a community organizer? To describe that, I'd like to borrow from a fellow community organizer, my mentor and the present co-director of the Industrial Areas Foundation in the United States, Mike Geekin. And he first begins by telling us in his book what he is not and what I am not and what community organizers are not. Not a consultant, not a facilitator, not an advisor, not a service provider or a do-gooder, not an ideologue, not a political operator, not a pundit, pundit, not a progressive, not an activist. So who am I and who are we organizers? We are people who understand human beings as political animals and who thus are comfortable with words like leaders, power, action, even confrontation, negotiation, relationships, organizations, compromise. We are people who, as Hannah Arendt might have put it, figure out how to make collective action in the public realm not just the exception and not just something done by professionals called politicians and elites. We are people who wrestle day in and day out with the challenge of building and nurturing a collective we in, an, in a world of me. I also often use the term in English enabling community. In its ambiguity, I find also its strength. On the one hand, community, so far as it is realized, brings positive effects. I think everyone pretty much agrees on that, both for individuals and for our life together. But community, on the other hand, always needs to be enabled, needs to be built and rebuilt, organized, disorganized, reorganized. It is always a work in progress, more like a tent than a building even though most of us are most comfortable in our permanent dwellings, whether they be our offices, our apartments, our labs, our shops, whatever. And so as a community organizer, I like the title of the program today, but especially the building part. We agree at some level that community is good, both personally and publicly in our shared life, even though we often don't agree on what it ought to look like. But again, how can there be community in a world full of diversity, and more specifically, in the world of town and gown with its numerous constituencies, with both its places where they intersect and also with their controversies? And in answer, I'd like to follow first a suggestion made recently by Luke Bretherton, a professor at Duke University, in a new book called Democracy, Faith, Citizenship, and the Politics of a Common Life. He contends that we are all part of what is called, or he calls, a community of fate. What I mean by this, he writes, is that in a world city, you do not choose either whom you live next door to or who lives in the next block or neighborhood. You find yourself living in proximity with people from whom you may be very different, whether individually or collectively. They may speak a different language, have different eating habits, 
or look at the world very differently. But whether one likes it or not, one shares the same fate as them. If the electricity is cut off, everyone loses power. If gangs rule the streets, everyone is under threat. And so the question, this is now me and not Bretherton, is the question for all groups becomes, how are we to be related? Not at all, blindly, haphazardly, or in a somewhat more strategic and planned fashion. And so now maybe it's clearer why I asked you to introduce yourselves to one another at the outset. With whom do you actively and consciously share this community of fate? Are you in some kind of relationship with others in this community of fate, especially those outside of your immediate group or environs? So I could have asked you to move around the hall and pick out someone or more persons whom you don't know, who are missing from the realm and the range of your relationships. And so the question is, with whom do we, do you, do you as part of institutions and part of the different constituencies need to build relationships in order to build community? It's not enough simply to live side by side, to live and let live. That's often what most of us, or maybe not most of us, but a lot of people think of as tolerance. And that, I think, misses the point of our shared fate. In fact, Sheldon Wolin, an American political philosopher, goes so far as to say, quote, that the problem of the political is not to clear a space from which society is kept out, but it is rather to ground power in commonality while reverencing diversity, not simply respecting difference. Reverencing diversity, that's a very powerful phrase. This means, however, that community must be intentionally, purposely built, and I would say one relationship at a time almost. In contemporary society that is mobile, individualized, and in large part mediated, community cannot be assumed to already exist. This holds true even when people share the same space, the same place. And it is even more pronounced when at least a good portion of the people involved are transient. From the standpoint of community organizing, you build community through consistent practices, through habits, rather than merely through methods and techniques. This is important because there is always the age-old temptation to turn what is essentially political into something technical, into a mere set of methods and tools, to turn questions of practical judgment into technocratic models. The habits that I'll describe in a moment may seem to some here to be archaic in a digitalized world, to others too slow, and to others perhaps too direct and personal. But they are habits, in fact, that have con consistently brought thousands of people together in neighborhoods and cities around the world to achieve positive change for the common good. And so I'd like to talk about three habits that are central to community organizing, and I would say central to all efforts at community building. They are the habits of relating, of acting together, and of organizing and disorganizing. The first and foremost habit is the habit of relating, of consciously building face-to-face -face relationships with others, especially with others who are other than I am, who are foreign or different, those perhaps whether implicitly or consciously, I've been taught or pretend to keep arm's length from, or who keep arm's length from me. And of course, my own perceptions of foreign or different or other are conditioned by the social structuring of my own reality. What may be sameness for one is a world of difference for another. And this is where reverencing diversity really begins from all sides of the diversity question, not only from the majority to the minority cultures. So relating is about crossing boundaries very directly, whatever they may be, of race, religion, income, education, status, ability, language, culture. Concretely, this habit entails then going out toward people 
and their institutions and associations and not waiting for them to come to you and not simply inviting them to partake in some program or offering or service that is available. That can be a beginning, but it certainly cannot be the end point, as I would understand it. Practically speaking, this means perhaps less flyers, less demonstrations, and less flash mobs, and more face-to-face -face conversations. To build a community organization, we usually do hundreds, if not thousands, of individual meetings with people throughout very diverse communities, whether it be in East Brooklyn, New York, or uh, East London, in Neukölln, and Wedding in Berlin, in the north western part of Cologne at the moment. And this means also in these conversations, not looking only at facts and opinions, not polling, but asking people, in fact, what moves them, what their self-interests are, what makes them tick in their public lives, not what you think, I think, makes them tick, or what you think they ought to be, or I think they ought to be interested in. But what are they interested in? Because people generally follow their interests. That's where they put their time and energy. They may not be the interests that we think are the important ones, but everyone, I think, is interested in one or more things, even in their public lives. And so to do this, also, one has to be willing to get at some of their stories. What is it that shapes the lives of the person next to me and the person a little further away from me, or the person uh, whom it takes a bit of challenge for me to get to know, and at the same time being willing to share a part of one's own story in order to hear the stories of others. What gives them, what gives me energy? What makes them angry? What is their focus? What vision do they have for themselves, for their family, for their neighborhoods, or perhaps some institution or group to which they belong? Practicing this habit of relationship or relating means not using your issue, my issue, to mobilize others for a cause before we even know who these others are and what they are interested in. We often believe we are connected, and we all probably have a device in our pockets that wants to assure us and guarantee us that we are connected, but how many people are, really, are we really connected to in and around them as persons and their interests? I mean, ask yourself for a moment, with how many people sitting here in this room even, even people with whom you work, have you had a non-business conversation about something that was not business-related or work-related and was, on the other hand, not purely social or banal, but had something to do with interest, motivation, anger, energy where people put their, their hearts to some extent. So at its core, this is the habit of reweaving, as it might be technically called, civil society through shared stories that articulate interests instead of prejudices and stereotypes. Self-interest, properly understood, as de Tocqueville would say, does not mean selfish interests. Rather, interests are literally in between us, and so can unite and bind us for action together. This is the work of creating a reservoir of bridging social capital, as Robert Putnam might call it. And it is real work, time-consuming and sometimes tedious, but also extremely, extremely energizing, and relational work that needs to be done before, and sometimes even despite a crisis or the press of everyday issues and everyday life. Such work is the crucial step that, unfortunately, so many efforts for change and engagement tend to skip when they jump directly into issue and action. They often can mobilize, but can they really organize, particularly in a longer term and relational sense? And so now I'd like to ask you to do something again more than just listen. Please raise your hands. Who is from the university community but not a student? Just so we can get a picture. Wow, most, most of you. Who are the students here? Who are residents of Maastricht but not students? 
And who is none of the above? A few. So now that we know who's here, we could also ask the question, who's missing? Take a look around and maybe think about who might be missing. And how might you have gotten them here? And where might you look for them? And where might you have to go to meet with them? The second habit I'd like to talk about is the habit of action. Actively fostering new relationships across boundaries that otherwise divide is certainly good in itself, but not nearly enough. Another round table, intercultural festival, or Twitter storm is not really what I mean by collective action. It is the habit of being able to come together with others around shared self-interest in order, in fact, to move some issue or agenda that people have identified for themselves forward. The community of fate acting purposefully together becomes a political community prior to any party politics. As Bretherton writes, this kind of common life politics is distinct from an identity politics and from multicultural approaches because recognition and respect is not given simply by dint of having a different culture or identity. Rather, recognition is conditional on one's contribution to and participation in shared, reciprocal, and public work. And that means often bringing people together who usually don't come together and who usually don't have access to the places where decisions are being made. I once gave a talk, and I won't mention which political party it was, to their foundation, and I was describing the process of community organizing in Berlin, and uh, a question came, well, why, why, do, why do we need something like this where, where these folks from the neighborhoods get together and start asking sometimes uh, very penetrating questions to their political leaders? I mean, you know, if we have a problem here in my neighborhood, I, I have the uh, mobile number of the senator in my pocket, and uh, I call up and everything is fine. And I could only reply by asking him whether, in fact, um, he thought the people in certain neighborhoods in Berlin even had a mobile phone at that time, or had the, the correct telephone number of the correct public official to call. And so it's a question, I think, also of how people, through the relationships that are built, can also take the initiative, in a certain sense, act preemptively and not just react to crises, but can identify for themselves what issues are and together address those other constituencies and groups who have a part in shaping what solutions might be. So it, ideally, it means sharing responsibility with public officials, administrators, corporate officials, and creating new partnerships that serve the whole community or the whole municipality, the whole of society better. Sometimes it also means holding other people accountable to the community of fate. Accountability means that there can and will be nonviolent conflict and confrontation. But it also means that conflict arises around issues that are less ideological and based more on shared self-interest. When legitimate interests on both sides are clearly stated and pursued in the context of the community of fate, they are most often conflicts amenable to negotiation and positive compromise. And the habit of public action that I describe is neither cynical nor naive about power. It takes power and actors who act powerfully seriously. They analyze it. They map it out. And they also know that power comes in many forms and that one of them is the power generated by people acting together a kind of power with rather than the power over that we generally experience in many spheres of our lives. It is this new experience of power with that energizes people, creates real change, and develops leaders from among those perhaps whom society does not very often see as the source of new leadership. The final habit, the habit of organization, can be summed up in the phrase that we use in organizing very much. All organizing is disorganizing and reorganizing. And once again, I'd like to ask you to do something active, although not raising your hands this time, but reflecting for a moment. Think 
about what mediating institutions you might be part of outside of your immediate work. A civic institution, a club, a sports team, a religious group, a union, an initiative. Why do you stay a member? Again, a rhetorical question. On the other hand, think of maybe one of those mediating institutions that you have left. Why? What are the reasons that you have left that mediating institution, have withdrawn your activity or your engagement? We know there's a need for longer-term frameworks of organization also in civil society. The business world, the political world, the academic world have these. And as we heard before, also constantly need to reflect and discuss what the parameters of them are. But also civil society needs to do, if you will, this kind of homework and reflection. And as, as an organizer, I would immediately add that such organizations need to be built, of course, around relationships and common action, not around formalities, bureaucracies, committees, hierarchies, and all of the forms that we usually put before the functions. This means they need to be more inclusive and more representative of those probably not in the room today. And from this, it also follows that existing mediating institutions need to do a good deal of healthy disorganizing and reorganizing so that they can energize people, not drain them, engage new leaders, find new leaders, and not do more of the same with less and less of the same old leaders. A word, perhaps, about the student constituency. Because of its relative transiency, it is perhaps the one most difficult to organize. What I heard this morning was extremely encouraging about initiatives taken by students, by uh, members of the civic community in Maastricht. There's a lot of spontaneous coming together, and that's very positive. The question is, how can some of that be maintained as students, as leaders come and go? Student leaders need to look for their successors even even before almost they become leaders? And how do student groups deal with this? And what can the university do to help? Perhaps to offer a framework for organizing practice without predetermining either student engagement or community interests. Perhaps just again a personal story, uh, some of the words that come again and again to me uh, that were that were said by Martin Paul when he was the dean of the medical school in Berlin and we were building a broad-based community organization in, in the vetting neighborhood, a neighborhood in which the Charité has a very, very uh, large clinic. And the fact that the Charité sees hundreds, if not thousands, of citizens or inhabitants of vetting every single day, but when the Charité as organization wants to talk to the neighborhood, to vetting, who does it call? Who's there? Certainly, you can call City Hall, you can call public officials and administration, but who represents in some way the civil society of a neighborhood, of a city, in a more unified kind of fashion, and is able across the board, at least in some extent, to some extent, to stand for the whole, as we would call it in community organizing, and be able to be a vis-a-vis -vis for the other institutions in society. And so there's one further related question I'd like to pose to you as I used the image before. Who are the tent builders among you? Who are the ones who day in and day out would like to weave people and organizations into webs of relationships capable of acting together for the betterment of this community of fate? Who are the community organizers in Maastricht, at the university, in the city? And so allow me in conclusion a few concrete suggestions for moving beyond the gap between town and gown. The first is, think relationships before program. Always build relationships first and build them around interests. Do this before setting up programs, whether from government, university, administration, or even, I would suggest, from students. 
Secondly, get into a relationship with people by talking to them about their interests, not simply by surveying them and polling them. Don't just assume you know them or their interests, and try to find, as I would call it here, the folks who are not usually in the room. Thirdly, act not just for, but also with people. Service is important, advocacy is important, but a further step is bringing people together so that they can act on their own behalf and for the, on behalf of a greater good. And especially do that with people who seem on the surface sometimes to be more the problem than the solution. Fourthly, provide training and mentoring for students and members of the academic community who wish to engage more directly with building relationships and fostering common action. And again, do this with a mind not just toward serving the less fortunate, but also toward enabling them to be active shapers of their own communities. And finally, consider developing a long-term and broadly based network of civil society groups that can mediate the short-term nature of student involvement with long-term interests of local residents, the university, and other stakeholders. And perhaps this is a task for which the university could be the base and the convener. The challenge of a lively and relevant democracy is not only a challenge on the national and the world stage, it is first and perhaps even foremost a challenge of building civil and political community at the local level in a diverse polity. Neither public administration nor markets can achieve this alone. Only a relational and active civil society, an enabled and enabling community, has a real chance of building community. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this stimulating talk. I think it's a, probably also the beginning of a conversation to be continued. As you pointed out, this is a global movement. Maybe it's also a, a good way, and Maastricht could be at the forefront of having maybe also think about an institute of community organizing for the Netherlands, and something indeed to be continued. Ladies and gentlemen, we had now some, some talks, some words, some, some food.